Hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. There we go. How's it going? Um, my name is Marcus, and I am super stoked to be with you guys today. I come from Detroit. I, I run the social aid. There you go. Holla. Three, one, three. Um, I run the social practice at an agency in Detroit, full service agency called Donor. Um, but I'm also a faculty member at the Ross School of Business, um, University of Michigan. But today, dearly beloved, we've gathered here today to talk about emotions. Now, emotions is a really important thing specifically for marketers because we marketers try to create emotional connections with consumers in an effort to establish loyalty-based relationships that ultimately drive commerce. And what we're finding over and over again is that establishing emotional connections are far more important than we usually thought. We tell stories to create emotional connections. And we're finding that these emotions Establishing emotional connections with consumers is often more important than the product being great in and of itself. So what an important time to talk about emotions. Consider we live in a hyper-connected world where ideas, messages, and products spread at a rate far greater than ever before and create tons of opportunities to create connections. And the data that we're able to gather from all of our behaviors is unparalleled. Every email, every tweet, every Google search, Every credit card swipe, even passively, the GPS in our phone is constantly shedding data. It's been uh, predicted that in 2020, there'll be 5.2 gigabytes of data for every human being on the planet. Now look, that may be hyperbolic, but I think we can all agree that there's tons of data at our disposal. But this is where things become paradoxical. While we have more data than ever before, data is growing at an exponential rate massively fast, our ability to extract insights from said data has only increased marginally. <clears throat> like, I have yet to hear a CMO say, yo, I am murdering the game because of all this big data. That my marketing's working 20 times better than ever before because of all this data. And though there's so much technology, technology is more pervasive than ever before, shedding reams and reams and reams of data, marketers still struggle with understanding people. We still struggle with understanding consumers. How is that a thing? All this data, and we don't know people. Well, I'll tell you why, after I remove this. I'll tell you why. Because we have tons of information, yet we mistake information for intimacy. Though we know a lot about people, we don't really know people. And this got us thinking a little bit. Perhaps there's some things that we can consider to better understand people so we can tell better stories, create better content, better products, better experiences, to create emotional connections that drive commerce, that build loyalty-based relationships. And as we dug into this, we found three drivers at play. There were three things that were present that really start to open up how we might think about this data paradox and calibrate the way we see the world. Should we talk about it? Shall we talk about it, question mark? Yeah. All right, cool. This is very interactive, if you didn't know that. This is the interactive week, so come on. Come on, guys. All right, so here's the first. Here's the first thing. Not all data are created equal. Now, look, I know that some of you work at agencies. Some of you work at startups, at MarTech. Some of you guys work at brands. Some of you guys are publishers. And you've got people who are, like, analyzing every little bit of data to understand people. But here's the thing. Not all data is as reputable as we like to believe. See, there's self-reported data. And self-reported data is that people report on themselves, i.e. self-reported data. And this data, you ask people a question, and they give you an answer, right? We see it in terms of like focus groups. We see it in surveys. We see it in, in, in interviews. And we ask people questions and they give us answers. But here's the thing, self-reported data is the worst. If I've offended you, I don't care. No, I'm joking. I do care. But truthfully, let's be honest. This, look, this is the trust tree here. We're going to be honest with each other. Self-reported data, it's flawed. At best, biased. But it's flawed. I'll tell you why. Here's the first. Because people are liars. They're not bad people. We are just prone to lie. Or rather, we're prone to present the best version of ourselves. For instance, um, do you guys know the, the, the dating site OkCupid? 
dating site, okay, Cupid? Thank you. I mean, I asked a question. Keep going. All right, so the dating site, okay, Cupid. Now, if somehow or another, the men on okay, Cupid are taller than all the men in the rest of the country. <laughs> how is that? How could that be? How, how, Sway? How? And here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can't blame the guys for lying because women want them tall, dark, and handsome. So guys are trying to get in the building, right? If this is the barrier just to get the date, okay, I'm going to fudge a little bit. We're liars. And guys, it ain't just you. Because the research showed from, from OkCupid that the more attractive pictures of women were all out of date. Exactly. And we know this. We know this intuitively, but also we've seen this in the literature from behavioral sciences. It, said, it says, the evidence reviewed is consistent with the most pessimistic view concerning people's ability to self-report accurately about their cognitive process. That is, how they think. It may be quite misleading for social scientists to ask their subjects about their influences, evaluations, choices, and behaviors. Because people lie. Not because they're awful people, but because the context in which we interact with people forces them or encourages them to represent the best version of themselves, to be a walking resume of themselves. And look, I'm not passing judgment because it's for me also. I've, I've done focus groups or surveys where they say, how active are you? And I'm like, well, let's see. There is a stairwell in my office. I go up it three times a day, so I'm basically the rock, right? <laughs> this is what we do. <clears throat> this is what we do. So that's the first. People lie, which is makes self-reported data flawed. Not only do people lie, but people don't know what they want. You ask people what they want, they're not being accurate because they don't know what they want. For instance, you know, we know this, this quote that Steve Jobs says about Henry Ford, that I think Henry Ford once said it, that if we asked customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read what's on the page before it's there. We have to predict what people are going to want because people don't know what they want. In fact, uh, Google some years back did some research where they asked people, a focus group, and said, hey, how many, how many, um, how many pages do you want? Or, or in your first page, how many results do you want? And they said, of course, give me more. I want as many as possible. And Google said, cool. They did that. And they did it, and it only added like a fraction of a second to, the, research, to, the, to the, the results. But then people were upset. They said, when I get down the screen, the further down the page, the, the links are less relevant. It's like, do you know how search works? <laughs> people don't know what they want. So not only are people liars, they don't know what they want, but also people are really bad at making predictions. Awful at making predictions. When the light bulb first came to the market, it was said that everyone acquainted with the subject will recognize it as a conspicuous failure. And these are smart people. These are, this is a society or an institution with tons of Nobel laureates. These aren't dummies. They're just really bad at predicting outcomes. Same thing with the telephone. President Hayes said, it's a great invention, but who would want to use it? And then we started to have penetration. I know, crazy, right? We started to have penetration within the U.S. The Brits were like, yeah, Americans need that because Americans are crazy. We have messenger boys. Come on. We're really bad at making predictions. We see it also when it comes to brands. There was some, uh, when, when, when Absolute was coming to the market, Absolute Vodka was coming to the market, they did a very expensive market research um, exercise to get a sense of the want, the affinities that people may have, the likelihood that they'll be into this. And what they found is that people said, look, I don't even know where Sweden is, let alone what's some Swedish vodka. This is Absolute. How can they miss that? Because people don't know what they want and they're really bad at making predictions. And to make this very, 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 very tangible, let's make this more present day. George Lucas pitched Star Wars several, several times and got dissed. Jay-Z couldn't get signed by any major label, had to sell records out of his trunk. They told J.K. Rowling, don't quit your day job. How was that a thing? Because people are really bad at making predictions. And to make this all the way salient, when Be you guys know Beyonce? She sings a few songs. Um, when Beyonce released her first solo album, the New York Times said, it's pretty good, but it's no Ashanti. <laughs> Come on, son. <laughs> Come on, son. No Ashanti? Come on. Come on. We're really bad at making predictions. And people lie, 
and they don't know what they, what they want. So self-reported data, it just comes up short. So the idea then is instead of looking at self-reported data, we should be looking at empirical data. That is observational data. We watch people in their most neutral and natural environment to get a sense of what they do. Instead of asking them, we watch them. Or as Yogi Berra would say, you can observe a lot just by watching people. Just by watching people. And what's really powerful is when you have self-reported data and empirical data, where you can start seeing where there are conflicts between what people say and what they actually do that gives you more insight around people. For instance, there was some research that was done <clears throat> They wanted to get a sense of hand hygiene, hand washing hygiene. And they asked people via telephone uh, survey, how often do you wash your hands when you go to the restroom? 94% of people said, I totally do that because I'm not a dirt bag, right? Absolutely, I do that. So then these researchers said, well, let's watch people where they're more inclined to be in very disgusting situations, disgusting scenarios, and see how often they wash their hands. So they went to some very high trafficked uh, airports and what they found is that people are disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And they're liars. Right? It's far better to watch people in their most empirical, most neutral environment to get a sense of what they're likely going to do. And the beautiful part about that, in this hyper-connected world where technology is more pervasive than ever before, there's so many ways that we can watch people in an empirical way based on their inquiries, what they search for on Google, what they talk about, where they go, what they actually do. And what happens is that as people behave, they share data. And as they share data, we can take that data to inform how we behave as marketers, as content creators, as product developers, as idea generators, as storytellers. But it starts with understanding people, what they actually do. And we know this, especially in the digital world, the zeros and ones world. Because we've seen research like this about eye tracking technology to get a sense of what people look at on websites. This is like the early 2000s research. So the darker the color, the more intense and longer people view those things. And we saw that right hand rails and the top of the, of the, the mass head, the top of the website, is basically like wallpaper. And what did we do as marketers? We said, let's get into the content. Let's create native content. Let's create branded content to be a part of the thing that people actually read. So we know this intuitively, but somehow or another, we missed the mark. For instance, take a look at this ad here. Now, what do you see? Now, most people would say, when I show this in class, most students, MBA students, smart folks, would be like, oh, I see the copy, I see the product, of course, I see the product, I see the logo, and I see Drew Barrymore's face. That's the self-reported data. What the research saw <clears throat> is that people actually looked at Drew, Jerry, Drew Barrymore's face, at the copy, hardly at the logo, and not very much at the product. Now, we wouldn't have known that if they didn't look at the empirical data. So what it allowed those markers to do was to optimize this piece of creative by shifting her eye. By moving her eye towards the product, people followed the eye and then started looking at the product to make the product far more powerful, the product message would be far more powerful than it normally would be. But we only get that when we get at empirical data. Another example. <clears throat> Baseball player, what do you see? So people say, I see the bat, I see the stands, Kansas City Royals, I see the logo on, his, on it, the patch on his arm, right? I look at the blurredness in the background, the portrait look at it. That's people will say. But when this research was done, they looked at women and men to see what, the, what they actually looked at. And the women looked at his face. <clears throat> Handsome mug, that guy. But then the men, a little bit different. Now the men say, I look at the stance, man, because I want to see if you really hit the ball. But actually, most men spend their time looking at his crotch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no judgments. But there weren't very many men saying, I was looking at his dick the whole time, dude. <laughs> Wasn't really happening. Wasn't really happening. Self-reported data just comes up short. So the idea then is we need to watch people in their most neutral, natural environment. Makes sense, yeah? Yes? yes? yes. Hands up, be with me. Hands up. Perfect, all right. So that's the first. Not all data are created equal. The second is that it's not enough to have just good data. There is a need for causality-based theory. Now, good data gets us very, very far, but good decisions require more than just good data. We have to understand causality, or better put, simply put, 
We need to know why. Why things happen the way they do. Why do people take on behaviors that they take on? Understanding the cognitive drivers that lead to the behavioral outcomes. Because when we have good historical evidence, that is accurate representation of what people actually do, good data, empirical data, and we combine it with causality-based theory, understanding why people do what they do, we can predict outcomes to a far higher degree. Now, if you're like me, you see a word in the screen and it just really, really irks you. And that word is theory. Practitioners hate the word theory. I haven't been, I've been in so many rooms with colleagues at different agencies, with brands from a wide spectrum of industries, and it always caveat, well, that works in theory. That works in theory. But in reality, it's this, Marcus. In theory, it's that. In reality, it's this. And when I hear that, I want to say, what do you think theory is? Theory is the principle by which actions happen. We make theoretical assumptions all the time. Almost every behavior we take on is a theory that an outcome will follow. We're constantly making theories. Like, let's share this because people share things that are funny. Let's share this because, let, let's make it this way because people love things that make them cry. Well, sometimes, maybe, we have theories that are just not causality based. And as, as uh, Da Vinci would put it, he who loves practice without theory is like the sailor who boards a ship without a rudder and a compass. He never knows where he may cast. If we don't have good causality based theory, everything is a gamble. So when we have historical evidence that is empirical data, and we can combine it with, his, with causality based theory, it increases the likelihood of an outcome. And as marketers, our job is to influence behavioral adoption. Everything we do is driven to do that very thing. So understanding the balance, the convergence of the two become prime, a prime task for us if we are to create emotional connections with consumers. So we gotta learn people. We gotta invest ourselves in the social sciences. Everything from social psychology, behavioral economics, network theory, anthropology, sociology, understanding why people do what they do. But the challenge is that we, as practitioners, as marketers, we don't know people very well. Or as W.E. Du Bois would put it, herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor, because all men know something about poverty. Not that men are wicked, because who is good? Not that men are ignorant, because what is truth? Nay, that we know so very little of men. We don't understand people. We have to identify causality-based theory to add to the empirical data that we have so that we can make better predictions. Makes sense, yeah? Hands up with me, yeah, hands up? All right, cool. So, we know that there's a, what we need, <clears throat> that not all data are created equal, and that we need a cause for, uh, we need, uh, need causality-based theory. Here's the third, the third driver, and arguably probably the most important. So while we have good data about people and we understand the causality of their behavior, great, it's incumbent upon us to put our humanity to work. To put our humanity to work. And by that I mean we as marketers, as idea generators, as content creators, as storytellers, as product developers, we have to be radically empathetic. We have to take on people's perspective if we are to make these emotional connections. Right? One, one put empathy is this. A prerequisite to empathy is simply paying attention to another person's pain. Understanding the points of friction that that person experiences throughout their life. I mean, one of the most creative places in this country, Silicon Valley, when they go out to acquire a new company, to acquire new technology, they're not just driven by the, the cash flow statements or the bottom line or how many followers they have or how many users they have. They subscribe to what's called the toothbrush test. The toothbrush test. I know, crazy, right? Billions of dollars for a toothbrush. No. The toothbrush test, as, as Larry Page will put it, is it something that people use more than once? And does it make life better? If we don't understand the pain points in people's lives, how do we make it better? We have good data. We have causality-based theory. But we have to be empathetic about the pain points in their life and identify those points of friction and ultimately 
relieve them. Identify the hurdles that people have in their lives and relieve them. That's the responsibility of the marketer. As we get all this information about people, we know why they do what they do. It's our job to play a role in their lives beyond being soda in a can, beyond having a sharper razor or a bigger burger or a car that runs faster or a shampoo that gets you laid. And to get there, we got to put our feet in the shoes of the network. We have to walk a mile in those people's shoes. We have to be radically, radically empathetic so that we might be able to have the intimacy that emotional connections require. We have to see the world through their eyes, which requires the taking on of perspective. Now, that's a very loaded, but yet like, yeah, perspective, got it. The thing about perspective is that we can look at the exact same thing from two totally different perspectives, this is something totally different. Completely different. The political system in the United States is basically that. Look at the exact same things from two totally different perspectives. Here, here's, here, here's the way I think about it. Um, my daughter, Georgia, she's like a fish. She loves to swim, right? And I take full responsibility of that because when she was very, very young, I pulled one of these numbers out. We're at the pool, and I do one of these, check it. Maximum air, look at that, perfect release. Amazing catch. Boom, I'm a great dad. Right, I'm a great dad. I know, I'm great, I'm awesome, I know. Right? From my perspective, this is what happened. I threw Georgia in the air just a little bit. Just a little bit. Georgia's perspective, maybe a little bit higher. Maybe a little bit higher. My wife's perspective, Marcus, what are you doing to my child? Perspective. We have to be able to take on people's perspective, which requires us to apply humanity. We have to put our humanity to work. It's not enough to have the data, the good empirical data about people. We have to also understand the causality of their behavior and then put our humanity to work. Makes sense, yeah? Yes. Hands up with me, yeah? Hands up? I don't see your hands up. You're not with me? There we go. There we go. So there it is. That's how we start to calibrate or to recalibrate this data paradox we find ourselves in. Like not all data are created equal, so we need to look at the behavioral data. We need, there's a need for causality-based theory, so we need to look at the social sciences. There's a need to put our humanity to work, and therefore we need to apply some empathy. And when we look at the world this way, it completely widens the aperture. From what are people doing, how can I interrupt their lives? What are people doing, how can I create some content to be a part of culture and hopefully connect. It requires us to move beyond the numbers and think about people. Now, to put this in, in context, I thought it, we thought it might be a good idea to show you in a case study. And we'll do this with, with, with one of our clients, uh, Potbelly. Uh, Potbelly is a, a sandwich shop, right? They sell toasted sandwiches, hand-dipped uh, milkshakes, and daily baked uh, cookies. It's awesome. Um, and their competitors are the Paneras, the Subways, the, the Jersey Mikes of the world. And when we talked with, with, with Potbelly, we said, yeah, you do those things that you do in the well. The sandwiches are delicious. Trust me. We do that really well, but why do you do it? Why do you exist? What's the conviction? How do you see the world? And they say, well, we, we, we do it to make people happy, truthfully. The founders who started this thing bought an antique shop, made sandwiches because he's wanted to make people in the neighborhood happy. It's like, oh, great. You're all about happiness. That is, you're not in the sandwich business, you are in the happiness business. You just so happen to make sandwiches. You just so happen to make cookies. You just so happen to make milkshakes. Now, here's a where you can play a role in people's lives beyond what you do by focusing on why you do it, right? We have a license to be a part of culture about people's lives now. Now, the thing about Potbelly is that they didn't have a whole bunch of money, right? Like, they weren't swimming in the dough by any stretch. Um, so, so we had to be very judicious about how we came up with ideas, how we put them in the world, and how we allocated resources to support them. Now typically what marketers would do is say, let's come up with some ideas, let's get a focus group together, ask people what they think of the work, and then that's the work we put in the world, the ones that, that, got, that, that was best received, right? There's an industry for that, Ipsos does that, right? Creative testing. But we know that self-reported data is flawed. So doing that would have been a waste, even though we would have felt like accountability shifted from us now because we tested it, tested it worked well, it tested well. If it fails, then those guys just lied to us, not our fault. But we were taking on 
the responsibility that the client's taking on. They need this stuff to work in the market. They want to connect with people and ultimately drive some transaction. So we decided to test the work in a different way. Instead of asking people in a self-reported way, we decided to ask their bodies. Um, and to do that, we reached out uh, just north of us at a school called Michigan State and their media advertising psychology lab that does a lot of this empirical work. And to talk you more through this, I want to invite my, my colleague, my co-conspirator, and my friend, Dr. Salim Ahabash, to talk a little bit more about it. Hello. All right. So I don't promise to be as entertaining as Marcus, which will fit perfectly with the stereotype of the university professor. But I hope I don't bore you to death today. Um, so uh, my name is Salim, and I work at Michigan State University at the Department of Advertising and Public Relations. And I also co-direct uh, the Media and Advertising Psychology Lab, where we um, look at what, how people are responding cognitively and affectively while they are viewing media messages from social media to TV, to TV content, anywhere in between. And um, when Marcus and I started talking about this idea, um, one of the questions that risen to the top is, well, you know, what type of happiness are we talking about? And there are so many definitions of happiness. And I'm pretty sure that if we survey all of you, you have different definitions of happiness. So is it this happiness, this type of happiness, or is it this type of happiness? Or is it the type of happiness that makes you cry, right? Because there are moments when we're so happy we cry. Um, and if, if I want to ask you, think of the last time that you ran across something online that made you feel this way. And I'm pretty sure that you feel that there are a limited number of times that you've really felt that way. But in most cases, you feel happy for a little moment and you take action. And this is what uh, is, is important to understand, is to understand the underlying process of how do we experience emotions. And it all happens in our brain and in our central nervous system. So anything that we do in life is really governed by the activation of one or both of our motivational system. We either approach or avoid external stimuli. So these are things that are built into our system. These are evolutionarily why we are here today, why we survived and we're not eaten by bears and you name it, right? Because whenever we're faced with danger, we tend to either run away or decide to fight, the fight or flight. And also, we approach stimuli that are important to our survival, such as eating, sex, and cat videos online, right? <laughs> and this is so important in the process, the persuasion process, and how people change their attitudes and adopt new behaviors or change their behaviors. Because now we have activation, something that activates our appetitive system, something that makes us biologically determined to do something, something that moves something inside of us, and what we do is automatically we go into all of these online behaviors, engagement with content in terms of likes, shares, and comments. But also this has become a predecessor to enacting changes in our attitudes and behaviors, such as purchasing or deciding to eat more broccoli, right? What we're finding out in the research that we do in my lab is that these behaviors, these online engagement behaviors, many of them are automatic, habitual, and very ritualistic. We don't really, I mean, how many of you, you are on your phone in the bathroom, and you see something, and you stop and think, am I gonna like this or not, right? You automatically press the like button. And that's what we did in, in the lab. We try to open up the black box that is the brain while people are actually experiencing social media. So what we did, we brought in Michigan State students and we told them, go on your Facebook and like something. And we recorded their psychophysiological responses. And we were mainly interested, we also recorded their eye tracking, so we knew exactly when did they press the like button and where their eyes were fixated at that particular moment in time. And we looked at the 10 seconds that preceded enacting the like button, so pressing the like button. So this is data for heart rate. Heart rate is something that is critical to our survival and to breathing and all of that. 
but it also has a psychological meaning. It can index several things. It can index cognitive resource allocation, or better known as attention. It can also index excitement and arousal. And in this particular case, we're, saying, we're seeing here a typical orienting response. And an orienting response is an automatic response that happens without our conscious knowledge. It is the what is it behavior. So if someone comes through the doors now and starts screaming, all of you automatically, your system, without any control, you will all turn and start looking at the crazy person who's screaming at the end of the room. And this is what happens when people are pressing the like button, right? They are not expressing emotions, but they are engaging in recognition of content, in attention paid to the content. And this changes a lot. I mean, if you look at how Facebook is now moving toward you know, enhancing engagement other than the like. They're not really happy about the like culture. They want to do more shares and, and more comments. If you look at everything that is out there, on Facebook, there's every single minute, there's over 1,317,000 status updates posted, 147,000 photos uploaded, and 54,000 links that are shared. In my newsfeed, they tend to have President Trump's face in most of them. And on Twitter, 448,000 tweets, tweeted 66,000 Instagram posts, and 29 million WhatsApp messages. So you have all of this, how do people like what they like? So how do you cut through the clutter? How do you engage people? And it all goes back to the basics. It all goes back to creating content that ignites motivational activation, and more specifically, approach motivation that need that this is something that is relevant to me. This is something that moves my emotion. And this is what is going to get you the engagement. So I'll give a perfect example of this. These are two posts, one by me and one by my much smarter wife. And this is a post that I had posted uh, when my daughter turned three years old. Pretty happy that she's grown so much. And I got over 147 likes. And my wife posted something extremely smart. So reading the work based on critical race theory, is very cathartic. And she got eight people to like it. And this is a perfect example of why people do what they do online. Because this is a picture that is cute. You know, who doesn't like pictures of babies? Babies, dogs, monkeys, anything that is cute moves us. It activates, it ignites our appetitive motivation. So this is so important when thinking about content and stories that we tell online. And what is the type of content that, it, that we're putting out there to drive people to engage with it, and to cut through the clutter of moving the threshold up of their activation and what they are experiencing. One of the other important things that I think um, is not talked, up, talked about a lot, uh, because quite frankly, we don't know how to quantify it, is context. The context in which all of these ads are placed really matters. So none of us, there is no two people on the among the billion or so of Facebook users that have identical news feeds. When we place ads in people's news feeds, they go into different worlds. We don't know what these worlds look like. So here you have an ad for uh, Saks Fifth Avenue placed right next to Tosh.0, very positive content. And we did a study in the lab where we tried to test that. We tried to see how would people process advertisements that follow stimuli of different emotional balance and arousal. So positive, negative versus intense and uh, not so intense. So we, we got these pictures that were pre-tested before of um, images that were low on, pos um, low on positivity, so pictures of animals, cute puppies, um, pictures that are highly, highly arousing and positive, and low and negative and, and high and positive. And we placed them right before ads for low involving products. And the ads were not so great. They were very mid like OK ads. They were not really ads that would move people. And the whole idea was we wanted to see is the, 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 the content that precedes the ad going to influence how people process the ads. And as a matter of fact, it does. Right? The, the pictures that preceded the ad informed how people responded psychophysiologically at the most basic and implicit level in response to these particular ads. And we also see some effect in terms of self-reported data. And the effect is that when it comes to positivity, the high positivity wins. 
when it comes to negativity, high negativity puts you in, in the dark, right? So what we do in the lab is we use these types of measures to try and index cognitive and affective processes. And you're going to see a run through of, this is an example of the data that we, that we collect. So we place sensors on people's hands to measure their heart rate on their faces, to measure the activation of their emotions uh, through activation of their facial muscles. And then we bring all of these data. We sample about 200 data points every single second. And we average it per second to create a trend of what happens every single second that people are exposed to this content. And this is what we did with the content that uh, Marcus and his team created. We brought the ad copy and we tested it in the lab. We saw where people are looking in the static ads. How are they responding to these particular ads? And here's what happened. Making people really, really happy. It's Potbelly's mission. But how do you own that position in the social sphere? When the competition outspends and outshouts you a gazillion to one, you have to outsmart. So we melded data, tech, and good old fun to feed smiles across the web. First, we set our sights on arguably the most unhappy place ever, Twitter. We found a hundred sad tweets, and had potbelly musicians respond with a hundred original happy songs, in real time, all during one lunch day. Turn it round, upside down. When we learned Paula's fish died, we answered her with this. Sorry to hear about your fish. At Megmoles fell out of a tree. Yeah, you're sweet in the day. I'm glad you're okay. No matter the problem, we had a happy response. I'm just gonna tell you you're the very best. Just think of the stars and planets and put a smile on that face. We flooded Twitter with smile songs. And Twitter, well, they smiled back. But the good vibes didn't end there. We helped entire cities in need of happiness by creating the Smile Scale a one-of-a-kind algorithm that measures the conditions that drive unhappiness and automatically serves back the perfect content. If it's raining in Dallas, they get this. If traffic is bad in Chicago, they see this. And if the Tigers lose, we cheer up Detroit with this. We even use psychophysiological testing to determine which content made people the happiest. And along the way, we made personal connections that created results. 10 times more brand engagements, 20 times more Twitter followers. And with almost no media spend, we generated a huge lift in store traffic, increased sales in the first 60 days of launch, and spread happiness to over 16 million people. That's a whole lot of smiles. During the first 30 days of the, of the campaign, we spent uh, totally $60,000 in media and saw a 1.4% increase in store traffic within those markers that we did for Smile Scale. And for us, this is a perfect example <clears throat> of taking good data, empirical data, where we don't ask people, we ask their bodies, can't lie about that. Psychophysiological study lets us know empirically what's going on. We apply some causality-based theory, but most importantly, we adopt people's perspective, understanding points of friction and relieve it, which is massively, massively powerful. So as we think about this world that we live in, this hyper-connected world that we live in, where we want to create some emotional connections that help us develop and sustain loyalty-based relationships that drive commerce, we got to do the exact same thing. Get the right data by using behavioral data, apply what we know from the behavioral sciences, and then take on people's perspective and put our humanity to work. That's where the opportunity exists. I hope this is helpful. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> All right, since we got a little bit of time, we can open it up for questions or you can bounce too. I'm not gonna judge you. My man in the red sweater, I'm judging you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, so if you have questions, we're, we're totally fine to, to yes. take them. There's one right here. Yes, sir. So what was the, uh, the strategy for Say it again. All right, so the first thing we did is they gave us all their, the popular gave us all their leads. Their, they call it the sandwich board. This is like the most active, um, the active customers that they have. So it's those leads, and then we cross reference them with Twitter to find their Twitter handle. And that's the, the whitelist that we started with. We started people who love the brand already and then de delivered happiness to them by eradicating where they was unhappy. Oh, just to like, my day sucks. Um, you know, my tire blew out, like, 
normal stuff, like things we know just from humanity. Yes, ma'am. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Heather. Okay, really quick. So you said that basically people are su like unconsciously liking things, right? It's like almost a visceral thing where like, boom, they're just doing it automatically. What would you say in response to someone in my industry where uh, they'll say, well, people don't like, our, like content because that's not the type of consumer that we have, right? Our consumers are effectively just voyeurs. They don't actually like content. That kind of flies in the face of what you're saying. And so I'm looking just for your insight on that. Well, th the whole idea is that you have such a plethora of content um, in everyone's newsfeed, and people do like things. I mean, I, 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 I study social media and Facebook, but I don't consider myself, I'm not the person who's going to appear in the newsfeed every single day because I don't post that often, but I'm a lurker, right? And I go through my newsfeed and I like things. So people will like things that activate that appetitive motivation because they make them feel something, right? Mostly positive. But also things like when we feel things that are relevant to us. And this is a prime example in this campaign, is taking these daily, um, you know, these average shitty day mo moments and highlighting them. And this is what's so relevant about it, is we all experience these terrible moments in our life, and it's relevant to me, and that's what created the engagement. It's only by... And I mean, but, but the whole idea is, yes, people are, I mean, it, it, it's so funny that you brought that up because when we talked about the self-reported data, we also asked people after each message, how willing are you to like it, share it, and comment on it? And we asked them on a seven-point scale, mm -hmm. and the averages came about between two and three, and Marcus called me up and he was like, what? I can't present this data, but people have become much more selective of how they engage online. And it is a subset of the population that really finds this relevant. So there's, I mean, there is no content that's going to appeal to everyone, and everyone is going to go flooding with, I mean, very few things that will get that viral, right? Just, sorry, as a follow-up to that. So really what I'm, two things. Did you segment that information, that, that feedback according to career and basi basically career, um, career and occupation? I'm specifically thinking engineers. And then further upon that, did you take a look at different platforms such as LinkedIn versus Facebook and how that potentially would perform? Because my organization pumps out content like you wouldn't believe. I do believe that we could correct or we need to make some adjustments to what that content is. But the, but the interaction rate is ridiculously low for what we have. And like I said, my people say, no, you do not see reaction because what you're dealing with or working with is a very technical audience and they effectively don't interact and they specifically won't interact on specific platforms. Then you should be on Reddit. <laughs> right? But the, the whole idea, so the common mistake that I see with marketing today is marketers talk for themselves, about themselves, about my product. It's about me, 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 right? But they don't talk enough about the customers, the audience, and this is what will drive the engagement. I mean, there, a, a few years ago, the norm was for every three posts that you have, two have to be totally not about you, but about your consumers. But, I mean, the whole industry is based upon shedding the light on the product. I mean, we were just talking about all the car ads, that they are all the same. There's a car that moves from one side of the screen to the other, but not much about the consumers. And people will only engage with content that they see relevant to them. When you truly understand who are the people that you are focusing on and targeting, when you, when you do that and understand what moves them based on research, empirical data, and behavioral data, this is when you'll get the engagement. So did you slice it according to occupation we did or not. did not? And you, did you slice it according to, like I said, perceived um, platforms such as LinkedIn versus you didn't? We did not. Okay. I'll give you my card afterwards, but if you do or something like that in the future, I will We've be done that in other studies. Okay, fantastic. I would like insight there. Thank you. Cool. Hi, I'm, I'm about this tall on the internet, but not in real life, so I'm on Twitter's. <laughs> uh, my name's Annabelle Blackburn. I work for an agency called The Social Element. Mm. We're the largest independent agency to deliver business solutions through social media for big global brands. Cool. So a lot of what you were talking about today was really fascinating, and thank you so much to both of you for coming through with that level of data and insights that all too often is missed out from these marketing buzzwordy conversations. Mm. 
Uh, one of the things that we specialize in is that we work with global Fortune 500s, and so we're able to work in about 50 plus languages, 24-7, 365. And we specialize in turning those frowns upside down because mm -hmm. we have a very human-led approach, so we ensure that that the, the interactions that we foster for our clients online are very empathetic, they're based on that human connection. But we're doing that in all of these different languages, and I'm curious to see from your perspective if you, if you saw in the data that you collected or just sort of your own insights, how much difference would you see based on a like, cultural interaction with data? Because now we're getting to the point where we can say, I want this in Detroit, and I want this in Michigan, or I want this in this language, and this in this country. So basically my question is relating to how generalized can we, let me reframe. We don't know about men, right? We don't know about humans. So how, how general can we be about how humans are going to react to something? Or how specific should we be in kind of tailoring data and interactions to different countries, different cities even, different topics? Is that something that you looked across, uh, across cultures about? Well, I think it was out of the scope for this research, but I think broadly speaking, the idea is that the closer we get to the things that are normative to the network, the more likely it is to resonate, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the entire population of the world, right, 7.5 billion, something like that, mm -hmm. right? You would say that the United States, like they are a, they are a network. 320 million people are more alike than the globe broadly. Now we all know that not everybody in America is alike, right? There's America and there's America and somewhere in the middle, right? So, so we know that just delivering something to Americans won't resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. But if you look at people who are in the Midwest, they're more alike than they are with people who are in, 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 on the coasts. Mm -hmm. People who are in Detroit, more alike than Michigan. So that the tighter you get, the more specific we get to the people, the more likely we are to resonate with them. The challenge is that we can get so minute to like my door, like people in my house are more alike than people who are on my block, right? But that requires tons and tons and tons of resources to do that. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, as an organization, whether it's an agency or a brand, what part of the spectrum do we want to be on? Mm -hmm. The bigger or the more broad the, the, the target is, the less connected they are. The less consistent the shared beliefs, social norms, unwritten rules, and rituals are. The tighter it is, the smaller it is, the more likely that small role network are to be alike. So you have to ask yourself, from a scale perspective, What's relevant for us? What's possible for us from a resource perspective? And then where do we balance how big we go versus how tailored and specific we go? And the great part about the media in this high protected world is that it allows us to get at very, very granular specificity around people. Mm -hmm. And the better we understand those social norms that guide their behavior, the better we are to resonate with them emotionally. Yeah, but it, that, it also that, relates to your objective, right? Mm -hmm. If your objective is to get awareness, then the strategy you're going to follow is going to be totally different than if you want to get behavior change or attitude change, right? I mean, all the behavior and attitude change theories say that the more tailored you are, the more successful you are, because people are seeing you different. Yeah, but if you want to ignite, I mean, this is why all the Super Bowl, I mean, a lot of the Super Bowl ads have animals in them, cute puppies, horses, <laughs> and all that, because these attract our attention <coughs> automatically. Babies, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure, all of you have had a drinking game for every time there was a monkey in a Super Bowl ad, right? <laughs> We've all had those. Um, so, sorry, you, you, you wanted to follow well, up? Well, no, that's, that's exactly. So we, we know that having a human-led empathetic response that's adapted to the language that we're, work, that we're interacting in works because we deliver consistent, amazing services for our clients. We know of that course, that language yeah. level matters. My, you know, I'm just curious about how would we even begin to synthesize information and data around that in a way that we could uh, attach um, the, the behavioral studies that you were talking about. So that's something that really is occupying my head at the moment of like, we know it works because we're humans and we're seeing that it works, but like, how do we kind of like lift the hood on that and take a look at the data, which is exactly what you've yeah. done. So thank you very much for the research you presented. It was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I wish I were this tall. It's all good. <laughs> No, because we weren't able to uh, apply the attribution that way. Like, like this campaign is what led to store traffic. <clears throat> if we looked at like engagement metrics, though that's not how we were basing success, we can say which one was which. Uh, but at the core, you know, the, the idea is that they played, they're supposed to be additive. 
um, we were going after like very one-to-one, I hate that word, let me put it, very hands-on, heavy-handed kind of interaction between the brand and you in an effort to get you to be like, this is amazing what Potbelly did for me, made my day, which is what we saw. The idea of using the algorithm is to scale the happiness. So instead of doing it from a brand to you individual, we do it based on the city, looking at drivers of unhappy, i.e. weather, traffic, maybe your sporting data and social behavior. So the notion wasn't like this one had a higher attribution than that one. The idea was that additively together, the alchemy of the two was gonna drive the, the behavioral outcome we're looking for. But in the lab, it was the songs. Yeah. The songs were like, people were firing up through the roof. That's what happened in the lab. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. My recommendation is you gotta look at those people beyond the labels of parents, donors, and students. You look at them like as humans. What are the shared beliefs, social norms, unwritten rules, and rituals of those people? Right? Like you know, we both, Celine more than me, are on college campuses, and like you know, there's 40,000 students at, at Michigan. They're not all the same, but like we label them as students as if that's a blanket response for who they are. We do the same thing with demography, right? We say you know, age, race household income, gender are ways to describe people. They just don't accurately do it. The, the idea then is to look at who these people are beyond the label of student, donor, et cetera, and then start identifying the, the points of friction that they experience so that you as a university, as a school, can start relieving them uniquely. And it may be multifaceted for students. There are students like this, like this, like that, and these are the points of friction that we can help relieve or eradicate. But with parents, alcohol can so <laughs> help. It always helps. And sleep. <laughs> Anything else? That's it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Helpful. Take care. Enjoy your South by Southwest.